Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy to introduce you to Revel 11 and we're so happy that you are joining us today. My name is Joni Parsons. I'm one of the co-creators of Revel 11. We created Revel 11 about five years ago to have edgy, meaningful, and fun conversations with women because together we believe that we will change the world. So we're so happy you're here today. Um, I'm going to bring up a quote um, that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and it is the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. It's such an amazing quote, and I don't know why sometimes it's so hard for us to figure out the why. Um, the first time that I heard Leah speak was right here on Revel 11 about a year ago. And I'm telling you, I felt that Leah was talking directly to me, jumping through the computer screen, sitting right here, and then coaching me and taking some time to really have a profound message about life and the why, and really figuring out the creativity that we all have in our life. Um, and that we have the ability to choose that life that we want to have joy, to have meaning, and to have it be fulfilling. And sometimes there's so much guilt or shame around living in joy. And I, I'm not exactly sure why we do that, but we do. Leah, I'm so happy to have you here today talking with us about creativity and le living a meaningful life. Welcome. Thank you, Joni. I'm so honored to be here. So Leah, we have talked a lot um, in the last couple of weeks, and I just want to start with your story and how you found that repurpose in your life and where that began. It was in law school, right? It was. It was. And I, not in the way that I expected law school to be. I thought um, idealistically, like naively at the time, that law school would be this place of enlightened learning and and but it and it was it was like an unintentional ashram of sorts for me, but not in the way I expected. It was actually because um, something that I I've spoken about and that we'll speak about in for future events here. There is a paradox there where I actually um, experienced a very deep depression, and depression not being like the opposite of happiness, but depression being helplessness, feeling that I didn't have choice. I didn't have creative agency. And it was like from that despair, actually, that I found a portal, a portal to meaning and purpose. And one of the specific ways I found that, um, I had sought help for depression and I, and I was told by the doctor that anyone who was exercising as much as I was couldn't possibly be depressed. So to go home. <laughs> And I was exercising a lot because I was a triathlete. And for me, movement and movement mm -hmm. outdoors were, was a meditative time, um, was, was a prayerful time. It was what allowed me to keep my head above water and function the rest of the time. So I went more deeply into that space. I didn't have um, uh, an official meditation practice at that time, but I realized I was tapping into something in those like hours on riding my bike out in the middle of the Iowa countryside or hours swimming in the pool in the mm -hmm. silence underwater, I realized I was tapping into something by being in my body and allowing myself stillness. And that something was um, something both greater than me and also something that was so fundamentally, eternally me, it started to inform and shift my choices and the, my outlook on life. And Leah, it is so hard for us as human beings to give us that time to either go and have movement or just be still or to just listen. And that's something you did during that time, um, that there is another way. There is another way. And it's hard. But at that point, again, the why that was a gift was it wasn't nearly as hard as feeling the despair. It mm -hmm. wasn't nearly, it, it became non-negotiable. And I think sometimes that is the, the paradox of a crisis in our lives 
is that we realize these things that we have relegated to being superfluous or a luxury like stillness, like time just being, like something that brings us joy, we realize that's actually necessary for, uh, for living, but also for thriving, for flourishing. And you're right that there is a stigma in our culture around joy and we, the way we stigmatize joy and that sort of deep self-love and time and stillness is, is with guilt and um, with shame. But it's actually those places, um, the theologian and novelist um, Frederick Buchner had said, you know, he talked about vocation, a vocation being some, a calling in your life, which I think of when I think of purpose, I think of like, what is calling you? And he says, God, you could think of it as the universe, like is calling you to that place where your deep gladness and the deep hunger of the world meet. And so I really needed to make a shift. And it's, it's like the core of what I teach now is that place of your deep gladness, what lights you up? What makes you come alive? What makes you just say from like the core of your being, oh, I love my life. I love my life. From that place of deep gladness, you tap into a wellspring. And from that wellspring, you become a channel, like humans are able to be, a channel for life. And that overflows the banks and enriches the lives of everyone around you and quite possibly very likely people you won't even ever meet. So when you find that creative compass, there is something that shifts in our lives. Tell us how it shifted for you even more into you know, your being, your core? Um, I began to make different choices. I, be, I revolutionized my relationship with myself. Um, part of this, like, I think it was like a spiritual awakening was realizing um, I'm actually an artist. I'm actually a creative. And so I graduated law school and the day after I thought, hmm, like here I have this degree and this training, I have a very real JD, but I feel not like a lawyer or an attorney. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I feel like an artist, like I have a knowing, a deep, deep knowing that I am an artist, and yet I have no art <laughs> to show for it. <laughs> I had no art to show for it. But I had, I had touched a knowing, and that felt precious to me, sacred to me. It reminded me of times where I touched knowings when I was a child, but we, all, we often will touch knowings when we're children, if, whether we remember it or not, but that knowing gets conditioned out of us because so often we meet children as how could you know anything? We have this idea of tabula rasa, like that a human is a blank slate and they're just there to be filled. That is not so, right? And children come, we come with knowings and it's, imperative that we, you know, shift our culture to a paradigm where we cultivate a trust in these knowings and a reverence and an honor for these knowings. And, but we can reclaim that as adults. Mm -hmm. We can learn to trust ourselves again. And when you're asking about the guilt and shame getting in the way, it, you can begin in small ways. The more you trust yourself, the more mm -hmm. that's, that energy takes on a momentum and whatever you give it attention and energy to in your life is what grows. And so giving attention and energy to this feeling of trusting yourself again, which is loving yourself again, which is believing in yourself again, which is giving yourself the opportunity to express and allow what you really, really want and then allow yourself action, creative action aligned with what you really want some like dams start to crumble within you, different life flows, and that's reflected externally. Mm -hmm. So Leah, let's talk about conditioning because we've all been conditioned from the day we were born um, with these societal norms. So we do have that choice to change those norms, but talk to us about how we can try to get through that conditioning that we have and break through that so into a better life. And you've done that a little bit, but how do we start breaking those societal things that we've been told all our lives? Um, curiosity, curiosity. Uh, 
awareness is, I mean, curi being curious is a way of being aware. Self-inquiry is like to know thyself. I mean, we've, we've heard this from sages, philosophers, thousands of years ago to present day. And to approach it though, the, the reason I wanna em emphasize curiosity is because you cannot be in a space of curiosity and also be judging yourself. And when you're curious, you're open, you're playful. We know from neuroscience that this state of being, this mental state of openness, playfulness in particular, is when your brain is most plastic. And that means it's most capable to change. Because when we're talking about conditioning, what we're talking about neurologically, biologically, is we have absorbed in our brains like network, we have absorbed external learnings, we've internalized them. And what that looks like biologically is that there are networks of neurons in our brains that are wired a certain way to tell us how the world is and who we are. So we are essentially rewiring our brain, retraining our brain, and we're reconditioning, reteaching our body how to see ourselves and how to see the world. And so being curious is a superpower and is an ally because it keeps you out of a stress response. It keeps you out of the critical mind, out of the inner critic state. It keeps you out of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn trauma responses and allows you to harness the miraculous, powerful, innate ability of our minds and our bodies to grow, change, and heal. And there are so many ways to be curious and so many ways to be playful. But for today's discussion, like that's um, I, I want to make sure I cannot nail that one enough curiosity. Yeah. So when we get to that creative compass, so when we are heading towards that North star, what happens? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> We've all felt it when that happens. Yeah. But tell us about magic. And then you had a story you wanted to share about one of your clients that got to that point. Yeah. So many of my clients get to this point. So it's hard to like choose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just blown away and honored all the time about what I get to witness and, and the work people do and what they're creating and the transformations they create. And um, one I was thinking of in particular, one of my clients was, um, she was, there were things in her life, and I think this is a, that's why this is a, a good example things in her life that she was thinking she wanted to change, but we've been working together long enough. She realized she had awareness that she was approaching some of these things from the vantage point that it was a problem and that she was somehow the problem, that there was something about her. There was guilt. She could tell there was, she had guilt and shame around, well, I can't fix this. What's wrong with me that I can't do that. There must be some character flaw. And, um, you know, one area that she wanted to shift was around drinking and another area she wanted to shift was around earning money. And I worked with hundreds of people, hundreds of women, hundreds of creatives. And th these are not, you know, idiosyncrasy. These are not specific to one person. This is common. Mm -hmm. And, um, but again, she had, she's done such beautiful work already. She knew, I don't want to approach this from thinking, I'm a problem and I need to fix this. I don't want to approach it from just a surface level, trying to change my behavior and then really pitting, trying to use willpower and grit. I want to make a, a true shift, a true healing and it come from a loving place. So we're holding this like in the sacred container of, of her work that, that is her life, that is her soul's evolution. And meanwhile, she um, starts noticing, you know what? It seems silly. It seems almost irrelevant, which for everyone listening, I want you to be on to those two cues. Those are great. I mean, they're not red flags. They're like a big X marks the spot where your treasure is buried. Those places where you, you feel something, you feel something rising within you, a curiosity, a joy, an inclination, a whisper. And then the critical voice comes in and shuts it down with, that's silly, that's irrational, that's not related to anything, that's too much money, whatever way, shut that, rejoice when you hear that voice, because it's telling you, it's the paradox, there's some rich, some richness buried beneath that there, 
And she was very aware and knew this too. So one of the whispers she heard, we call them golden threads, um, is often how we talk about it in art school, following these golden threads or whispers. One of them was, you know, I, I wanna ride a horse. I wanna ride a horse. Never really ridden a horse. Now I wanna ride a horse. <laughs> so she followed through on that, called around to some stables, went to visit, first just pet the horses. And then she was there. They're like, well, do you want to get on the horse? She's like, you'll let me get on the horse. <laughs> and she came back to one of our art school mastermind meetings and was just profoundly moved by, she's like, I don't know what happened. And again, like, it seems silly. We're like, it's not silly. We're holding the space. Something profound happened. She's like, when I was sitting on top of this animal, I just felt things shift. So fast forward, she gets riding lessons. She goes there often. She has a favorite horse. Things start to move. And then a little further down the road, she's like, you know what? I really want to do voice lessons. And then she heard the voice. Oh, that's silly. You're already riding a horse. What does this have to do with your art career? What does this have to do with, you know, painting or making money? But she could tell it had the same tenor and flavor of like a golden thread of a sacred whisper to follow. And so she, there was, again, this is the magic that was happened, boom. And our like not huge metro, <laughs> the South Bend, you know, Michigan, Michigan area I live in is not this big metropolis, but she found through ease and synchronicity, um, a vocal teacher who also was interested in Reiki work, also approached things from this intuitive holistic perspective and also is classically trained musician. And she worked with her and there's so much with our voice. There's so much with being in our body and there's so much with using our actual literal voice um, that is profoundly healing and shifts things. And she began, she already had a beautiful singing voice but it just developed. And then she began to write songs. She's like, what? Now I'm a singer songwriter too? And we're like, go for it. So she's written music, written, you know, recorded them, continues on, continues on, continues on following other threads, and then um, turned back around to the money work, had this experience where she's like, you know, this is the state, the state of being, the state I feel I'm in of joy, deep gladness, connectedness, openness, rootedness also when I'm on the horse or when I'm singing, when I'm in flow, we call it being like the affluent artist when I'm in that flow. She's like, that is how I know my artwork, my art business is also going to flourish. I just know it. I just know it. And so we talk about working with what's working and celebrating that feeling in that state at all times. So there was this day where she was at a 7-Eleven with her son getting gas and a gentleman said, oh, you, he's like, you're such a lovely family. He's like, I'm going to buy your slushies for you. And they were just giddy with it. And she shared that. She's like, it just felt like this moment of great affluence. It felt like a million bucks to have this stranger say, I love seeing a mother and son smile at each other like that. You're so lovely. And she's like, that's such affluence. I know that's the same feeling as creating money with your business. And so not, not 48 hours later, not 48 hours later, she came back and reported to our group that she'd had an old um, patron call her up and, and ask for a painting commission, ask to, um, she was interested in a $5,000 painting and she dropped by and while she was there, perused her clothing that she also paints and was like, oh, and then this article of clothing, which is $1,200, I'll take that too. Oh, and by the way, and then later gave her like a thousand dollar tip just for being, and she's like that, that state was like the same. She's like, that is that same state that was cultivated by following those threads that seemed silly and insignificant, mm -hmm. but no, it was cultivating those states of joy, of that expression. So <laughs> and then you also mentioned that she, because she was living in this new state that she had, that she found that she wasn't drinking as oh, yeah. much oh, yeah. as well. That's the other part. Thank you for reminding me. That was the other part. And it was almost, it was almost um, an afterthought. She was like, you know what? I realized I'm not thinking about drinking. It's not a problem. It's, she's like, I'm not, it's, she's like, it's, it's just diminished. It's just diminished. It's just gone down and gone down and gone down. 
And th that, that, right there. that is very typical of the way that turning your attention and plugging into what brings you alive, it doesn't neutralize, it just turns your, you're so full that a lot of these things that we were ruminating in and trying to solve, we're in a problem solving state. So we keep our life, what we keep activated in our lives are problems and a sense that we are the problem. Whereas allowing ourselves joy, it activates a different state. We like move into a different frequency. And, and when we're there, we are not available for what's not a match for that. And what's not a match for that is guilt, shame, or the accompanying problems that perpetuate guilt and shame. So it really liberates you, in other words. Liberating. It it's is liberating. liberating. Yes. Pardon? It is. It is. You, that's the perfect word. You liberate yourself. You're also liberating your life force. Your life force is not embroiled in problem solving and then problem creation. So you can keep on problem solving your, your life force, your creative energy is liberated and can go to creating what you actually want. So it's also about releasing then Leah, right? It is, it is. And it's approach is sometimes we think release, we got to work on how to release. So we make releasing into like a project and kind of a problem without like, why can't I let this go? Mm -hmm. Why won't I let this go? So the release that happens though, it's, it can, it can be in a way like this, where the release happens by allowing yourself more and more attention in stillness, in what takes you to those states of peace, gratitude, effortless joy. I love that so much. <laughs> I know that we've all been there where we've been, you know, thinking about something that's been an ongoing deterrent to success and joy and feeling that way. And I know that just from that conversation we were just having that I, I need to release a couple of things and I'm committed to doing that. So tell us how it feels to be a powerful creator. What does that mean to you? And what does that mean to your clients? I think being a, feeling like a powerful creator, you trust that you have everything within you to fulfill your heart's longings, that you are capable. And that when adversity rises and it does for all of us, that you can handle it, that you are resourceful and also in those places where you feel you are not well resourced, you can be your own greatest ally and friend. And from a very loving, non judgmental place, you, may, you can be curious and investigate how can I be more resourced here? I know I'm capable, I have a growth mindset. I know if I ask, I shall receive, and beginning to take to be an agent. And so it's a feeling of agency. It's a feeling of whether there's a challenge in front of me, I can navigate it, or whether there is a dream that's calling me, that's something I'm longing for. I have everything within me to fulfill it or to become resourced and fulfill it. I think letting go is so hard for people because when you get, you start associating with something that's not serving you, like for instance, my weight has not served me for a long time. And it's a story I keep telling myself. Why is it so hard to let things go like that? Well, you know, it's not your fault. It's not anyone's fault when it's hard to let go of those things because it's it's little, it's it's part of it is what our brains have been evolved to do for you know millions of years now that the most primitive part of our central nervous system has been evolved so that our brain we have a negative bias. We know this from neuroscience. We do. <laughs> and so it is our brain, like it is that negative bias where it looks for what's bad or what's a problem. That's the first thing it does. And then the second thing it does is it make, it blows it up. It makes it the biggest thing so that it gets the most attention from you because that was an evolutionary, a move on the part of evolution to keep us alive. <laughs> and then the other thing it does is diminishes what's going well and it diminishes possibility 
And so again, here's where like curiosity and awareness, awareness and curiosity are curative. And so being very curious about it and instead of approaching things from like, a, oh gosh, I have a problem. Like this is a like, curious, I wonder why this has come up for me. Like with me, with my the depression in law school, it was a difficult shift, but I like worked to be like, what if this isn't, what if this doesn't mean there's something wrong with me that mm -hmm. I'm depressed, which I don't believe now at all. But at the time I felt such a stigma about it. I'm like, what if this is actually, how else could I see this? And I've, and I want to offer that phrase as a powerful tool for anyone. How might I see this differently? How might I see this differently? What is the most beautiful, loving story I can tell myself about the situation? Because anything that is manifesting in our life is distressful to us can oftentimes be a way that another part of us, our psyche, our soul, some long shut down aspect of us is trying to get our attention. And too often we think, well, it's trying to get my attention. It's a problem and I just want to get rid of it. And then the problem persists because we're not actually giving it kind, curious, compassionate presence and attention. We're not being like, you know, we know the difference when someone's with us, whether they're like, yeah, 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 on to the next person. I'm going to say hello and get on with my networking versus somebody who is like has a genuine, authentic desire to like know us and see us and connect with us. And so I think oftentimes those things that are persistent like that, they want our attention, but a different tone and quality of our attention. They want our loving attention. They want our non-judgmental, full-bodied presence. They want our authentic attention without sensing that we have an agenda. <laughs> and we just want to get rid of them. It is some aspect of us that we're trying to push away that is actually, you know, this work is healing. The root of healing is to make whole, to make holy. It's a part of us that wants to be brought back into the whole. I love that so much that we have a choice to make, you know, every time we have a negative thought, we have this choice to turn it around into a positive. Yeah. And we have a, and we have a choice. That's, I love that because we have a choice, what you're describing. We have a choice in our relationship with ourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, that's something that a term that can be thrown around. And so I want to offer some more specific ways of approaching how we're in relationship with ourselves. We change the quality of our, the way we speak to ourselves, our tone, right? How, instead of like short, clipped, critic, like soften the tone. Um, there's a technique used in psychology called third person, person distancing that is powerful and highly effective. So instead of saying, well, I do this and I do that, or why do I do this? Why do, instead I would speak to my, Leah, I see that you're having a lot of energy around this upcoming Revel 11 workshop. <laughs> it's energy that you, you know, you want to rush to describe as anxiety or nervousness. And, oh my gosh, it's energy that reminds you of tests and you don't want to do like, Leah, I sense this. I sense this, like what's going on, Leah? And so you could speak to yourself that way, Joni. Like, Joni, I can tell there's, there's a weight on your shoulders. I can tell there's a heaviness in your heart. How might, how might we look at this differently, Joni? Like what's the most, in like sweetheart, what is the most beautiful way we could approach this? What's the most beautiful story we could tell about this? And so when you're doing this, you're starting to, um, you know, not many of us have been consciously taught how to be an ally and a friend to ourselves. Most of us have had plenty of exposure to like the cult of criticism, which is dominant in our world. Yes, it like, is. The way to improve yourself in your life is through pointing out your flaws, being hypervigilant of your flaws, and the unfortunate truth is that goes really well. It's like Velcro for the negative bias of our brain. Mm -hmm. So those two things, the cult of criticism in our culture, which is mm -hmm. a, I, which I talk about a lot 
with creatives especially, but everybody, no one is immune to this. And then the negative bias of our brain. But again, having awareness that this is what's going on puts us back in a position of authority and agency being like, oh, okay, I can still be the leader, the energetic leader, the master of my life, like of my domain. And then, so how do I want to set the tenor and tone? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, we're getting so much in the um, chat. I just want to read you a couple of things. Yeah. It's like maybe like a beginner's mindset, like, I wonder what would happen if I tried to do this differently. That was Laura. And Tara says it's a way to soften our inner critic. And that's so true. I mean, we're so like you were saying, we're so critical of ourselves and we have that negative mindset first and um, sometimes most profoundly. And then Laura says, oh, my God, yes, the cult of criticism and not an ally for ourselves. Um, and then this is a million dollar workshop. Oh. <laughs> so, um, yes, that's just so profound. And something we forget is that we can change the negative to the positive and, you know, easier said than done a lot of the times, but if we're committed to doing that and just bringing the awareness, like this conversation, Leah is bringing the awareness to the top that it's possible. Yes. It's possible to shift. And you don't have to live in that negative space. You can live in a yes, joyful, positive, meaningful life and thrive. Joni, I, I love that. That, you, that 100% knowing, and this is, this is why I love the work that you do and what Revel 11 stands for, like standing for what is possible and giving people a place to dwell on what's possible to come yes from the to a beginner's mind again to be fresh and alive with life again and to be renewed to be restored and to see what is possible and dwell in that space longer and you said you know it's not easy it is possible and it's, it's possible. also rewarding it's also so i mean i i I totally understand that it's not easy. And then I'm thinking too of being on the, like the inner, the circles and with the people that I get to work with and they're doing work that you could say is hard work, but there is such joy and fulfillment that like those sessions are, um, I mean, I feel like we, we talk about, does anyone know what we're getting away with in here? <laughs> It can be like this oh, let's fun. That, Leah. Let's get away with more. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can we can okay. get away with a lot. I mean, we laugh a lot, we cry a lot, and then magic happens. And then also it's this amazing discovery which people should have their whole lives of, oh, I didn't know that was in me. I didn't know that was still possible for me. Oh, if that's what's in me, like what else is in me? I have a client right now who's had a long, very successful career as a preeminent physician. And she's also been an artist, but she didn't think of herself as a real artist. And now she's doing things where she's just overwhelmed. <laughs> to talk to you about really taking care of the central nervous system and body when you're doing growth and transformation like this because it's part of being an ally and making it sustainable. And in doing the hard things, it, it can, it, shifting your central nervous system, shifting your mind, um, you, you don't wanna force your way through it. You, you're loving to your creature self. So, you know, she's having these major epiphanies and these major breakthroughs and all this art's coming up within her. And she's like, what is happening? <laughs> and, and then like, yes, might be a good time to lay down on the floor. <laughs> to ground to let it integrate and then we'll pick up and carry on with a, our bad selves and what we're getting away with loving your creature self I love that yeah. um so we are going to be doing a workshop here in Seattle and also a retreat this fall and we'll be talking more about that towards the end of our conversation but Leah one of the things that you talk about a lot is the power of paradox and I would love for you to fill us in on what that is and what that means to you and everyone who's listening today. Well, one of the core teachings of one of the core philosophies in the art school method and approach is embracing paradox. 
And, um, you know, it's been said that like the mark of a great intellect is the ability to hold two opposing ideas at the same time and to be able to engage with that. And there, like so much of our life wants us to be binary, this or that. It wants us to be binary. Tell me who you are. Tell me what your one purpose is. And it wants to tell us like the contradiction is somehow um, as, uh, evidence of confusion or falsehood. But really what I find people are craving and are ready for now is depth and they're hungering for soul, they're hungering for truth and nuance. And we instinctively, intuitively know that paradox is the truth, that life is death, that creation is destruction, that is all the same thing. And it's really hard for our analytical, reductive, logical minds to wrap its way around. But what I find the hunger is for is for a deeper wisdom to allow to emerge in our lives where we are not so rigidly analytical and binary, but we're like poets of the soul, athletes of the soul. We're moving and expressing intelligence in ways that I think are really evolutionary. And that in the past we might've relegated to um, professional artists, mystics, sages, but is really the, the way that we are all going to coexist, cohabitate and flourish together in an, in an age when, you know, it's the divisiveness, the pitting, it's the binary is what's threatening our society and planet. And the answer is to embrace the spectrum. And so all the time we're talking about the power of embracing paradox. And one point in particular that I wanted to share with listeners today are those places of, that, of difficulty can be the portal to mm -hmm. your greatest expansion. And your ally in that is curiosity. Your ally in that is honoring yourself and your hunger. Can you talk more about that? Can you talk more about the portal of, of belief that we mm -hmm. can do it? I mean, you, you are all about that. And I just think that being able to change, you know, our, our lives, I mean, we can live like, I'm just going to raise my arms up. We can live like this. It doesn't have to be a narrow path at all. And so many times we're on that narrow path because of these roadblocks that we put, you know, in front of ourselves. And you are all about the possibility of what's, what life has to offer, what you have to offer life. Yes. Oh, I'm just, I'm just so blown away. Sorry. Every time I talk with you, I'm just blown away even more, Leah. So. Oh, oh thank you. With, and your, I... with, with your, your story and with with what's possible well you know it, it's in here's something else i wanted to share because thank you for that and i have found and this was a major turning point for me and an evolution a shift in my journey was discovering that creativity and healing and transformation are most powerful and as a communal experience and so that like here that means you're asking questions I'm like, I'm a, I honor the fact that there are people who have taken time out of their lives. And so I'm tapping into the best that I can do to deliver a message that speaks to them. That's a communal activity. That's, you know, I, I love jazz musicians because they, there's an improv improvisation that goes on, but they are playing off the energy of the audience. It's a communal creating. And um, I think that's also part of this, what I see as the progression of our evolution together is this knowing that it's done together, it's not in isolation, definitely. I mean, I, I need a lot of my hermit time, that's for sure. But again, here's the paradox is it's both and it's the spectrum. And something that you said earlier and you made me think of it just now, and I really wanted to make sure that um, I emphasize this, knowing that it's possible, knowing that there is something like I wrote in the description for these events that you have a magnificent shimmering destiny, mm -hmm. whatever that means to you, 
that is possible. And to make the connection in your brain and in your body to where those aren't just pretty words, it's real. Making, and I did a podcast episode on this, that the most important connection you can make is that this is real because that changes everything. When you're kind of doubting that it's real, you've got one foot in, one toe in what you're doing, not much changes. Your energy has to change. Something has to shift. You have to shift and being like, you know what? There are two ways to live my life. Like Mm -hmm. one back here, afraid that this might not work out. And one like, what if, what if I just go all in on this, Mm -hmm. that it's real. And so establishing that ahead of time, giving yourself permission, it can be so scary if when the later we go in life that we become, you know, we become jaded by disappointments and failures. It can feel painful to believe in possibility again. It can be, it can feel painful to believe in change. So it's to be with yourself in a loving way to heal those wounds to love on yourself and say, but are you really going to quit? Do you really Mm want to quit? Or aren't you going to just keep going? Because if we're going to keep going, how do we want to go then? How do we want this to be? And and I I, want to say that we've all felt those times where we've been in flow or have made a decision where, say we made a decision to close one door and then you can't even imagine the opportunities or the doors that open when you've made that decision and to live in that space and to know that it's available is just, and to live in it more is what you're talking about is that we all have that capacity to live in that joyful flow state. And like you said, be your magnificent shimmering self Mm -hmm. more regularly, like on a daily basis in the moments and to recognize those moments. Yes. Yes. Because it's not just about standing up on the stage and receiving your Oscar or Grammy or, you know, getting, hitting that, you know, next level of income that you've been gunning for. It is in the day to day feeling alive and in love with your life. Mm -hmm. And it is um, a shift from like, again, being aware. And and here's, uh, I want to keep weaving back the the concepts and the ideas back into some practical applications and tools. Look for the places where you're saying, I can't. Like, look for the places where you instinctively say, no, I can't. Instead of just, instead of right away saying, I know, and I say no, and I can't pause a little bit and breathe and let yourself be like, what if I could, but is there a way I can see this differently? Do I really want it? If I really wanted it, how might I do this? What would saying yes look like? And just play with it. You don't have to go there if it feels too scary, but what you're doing, you're keeping the portal of possibility open a little bit longer. That is literally changing your brain. You are literally becoming a different person just by pausing, by noticing when you're saying I can't and no, and instead being like, okay, we don't even, we don't have to make a radical shift today. This is not leap in the net will appear. This is breathe for a few moments. Mm -hmm. This is consider looking at it differently. And again, that changes your brain. That changes you. That changes your brain's ability to see possibility and that you will find yourself beginning to move towards yes more and more. And just this last week, we were one of my clients was celebrate like she's had a big year of yes. She realized, I mean, she had a big, beautiful life before. She just didn't realize the extent to which she was still slowing her own role and slowing down her expansion create, creatively and otherwise by saying, no, I can't yet, I can't yet. So she started doing this. And so this last week she celebrated when she was on vacation with her family, she had done an outdoor swim in, um, in Idaho with 540 other people, 1.76 miles. She's not a triathlete. This is not something she does on the regular. She did it with her adult son and a brother-in-law. It was along a bridge and she told the story and it was moving and healing on so many levels, had so many metaphors for her writing process, her, her career. 
so many metaphors she said she could see her family walk along the bridge up above her and she said the experience of that of her saying yes to this mm -hmm. then allowed her the experience of seeing her family walk along above her she said with her every step of the way but she said healed she had no idea this would happen but she said there were times in her life when she didn't feel her family walked with her mm -hmm. and she said here she was kind of struggling <laughs> for a while <laughs> kind of getting nervous. And so mm -hmm. all of, you know, it didn't go from, she started to consider this and then the next day she hopped into a huge open swim like this. Um, but it's that it can be as gentle or as enthusiastic and aggressive a process as you Absolutely. like. Absolutely. I just want to point out a couple of things. I mean, this is a reminder for all of us to pause. Mm -hmm and breathe and then to make things happen like leah said you don't have to jump into it with both feet like the one of the things that i always tell myself when i have a goal or a vision is i do one to three things mm. maybe more every day towards my goal towards that vision and that's been really successful for me and you know to be able to manifest um goals and ideas and it's been a really beautiful thing just do one to three things every day towards your towards whatever it is that you want in your life yes. so yeah so let's talk a little bit leah about um this fall and we are um, going to be hosting you here in seattle um, for a talk on the creative compass do you want to talk about that a little bit and then into the retreat that we're having with Rebel 11? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm so excited. So excited. <laughs> I know. I love the Pacific Northwest. Um, and this is actually an example, Joni. I don't know if I've even told you this of um, what happens when you're in a space of synchronicity and flow and when you even just begin to allow yourself to articulate what you really want. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know, throughout my, my business model changed somewhat because of COVID. I do a lot of my work virtually like this, but then it all went virtual. And for everyone, things changed. So as we sort of came out of that, it was a great spot for me to stop and reflect. I'm like, what is it that I really, really want? Like, what am I yearning for? And I was, one of the things that was clear was being with people in person. Yes, absolutely. Uh, like it's I, huge it's so I mean it's just just for a moment it's just that appreciation of being with people again and I think we took it for granted for so long and now it's like oh I get to sit with you to be with you it's the most beautiful <laughs> well it, it it really is and I and I was thinking back to like I had this craving for you know years back on my journey the first time I went to retreats <clears throat> and it was a Martha Beck was the I went to a few Martha Beck things and it, it, they were turning points. They were like, those retreats for me, there was a before and an after. And they were so magical. And, you know, Martha has been like a, a mentor and inspired me so many times along my journey. And I was thinking, oh, that kind of magic and in person is what I want to feel again, what I want to offer again. And then, you know, and also full just like I see names in the audience here today or who are people that I met on those retreats years ago and have been like, I mean, I'll get choked up thinking about what they've meant to my life. Um, and so Joni, you didn't know that, but I was I'm like, I want in person and I want to collaborate with people who feel the way about this work that I do, mm -hmm. who love it, like want to offer joyful, magical experiences that people think about for the rest of their life. Nice. And then we had our conversations. <laughs> I love it. I love synchronicity like that. I know <laughs> we didn't have to like figure it out. You know, it just came together. Yeah. And Liv, I just want to say something. So my experience with Leah has been so profound. So last year when we talked, you know, online, we had never met before. And actually Monica Huntsbury, who's in our audience today, did the interview with Leah. And as I mentioned earlier today, it felt like Leah was talking to me, sitting right here in my room, coaching me. And from that talk, 
I made two major decisions in my life. I quit several clients um, that I've had for a long time. And since then, so many doors have opened, but it was because that because of that conversation last year here on Rebel 11. So, you know, one of the reasons why I asked Leah to come to Seattle is I can't imagine what's going to happen when we're in person. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for not just whoever comes, but for me too. So with that, I'm, I'm just thrilled that, so it's in October. And um, so we're going to have an in-person event here in Seattle and then a small intimate retreat um, up at our retreat center in Roslyn, Washington. Yes. And what can people expect? More of this beautiful conversation. Massive magic. You can expect massive magic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Joni and I've been talking about like laying out topics and um, cause there, and we often say we could talk for hours, but we also want it to be what, um, you know, think of the, like the biggest domino, or I think of it as master key. What can I offer you that what key, like that if you have it, it's not only one lock, one door, but it's like boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. And creates so many shifts in the rest of your life. And so I love to walk the line between, yes, we have, here's, here's the plan. And I also know that the magic comes from being open to what wants to happen. And I also know the magic happens when you see who comes and what their particular lives and souls and psyches have to bring and have to offer. And so it's this beautiful dance between being aware and um, prepared for what could happen and also having the, I think it takes a master level skill to let go of control and surrender and be a facilitator and a guide for what wants to happen. Because I, the, the way I approach this work is every, every, everyone comes with their genius self and their soul and so I'm not here to tell you what to do or how to run your, I'm here so you can experience your own profound wisdom and truth and knowing and experience it in a way that you feel it. You don't have to think about it later. You remember what it feels like so that this is the creative compass. So you don't have to think about what you do in your life. You go back to that feeling, that ex visceral, experiential phenomenon of what is truly you coming from you and that that becomes a touchstone for you going forward. And so having the opportunity to be in person um, is such a, just a profound gift to be able to really dive in mm -hmm. and again, like work with, um, we, we you know, work with the body. We're working on like just different subtle energies as well as with the, you know, intellect and imagination. Yeah. And so many things in the chat. It's like, she's exactly coaching me today. Um, thank you so much for this massive magic. And Monica Huntsbury says lots of magic whenever we're together. And then just so many lovely um, comments about you, Leah, and the art school. And I just want to say that if you ever need a little upper, <laughs> a little reminder about Leah's message, go to the Art School podcast. I listen to it all the time. And when I'm driving over to Roslyn to our retreat center, I, you know, play two or three and I'm just so uplifted. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. I've got this, you know, I can change my way of thinking. And I would just highly recommend oh. um, her podcast. And, you know, we just found out um, as I was listening um, a while back, that it's in the top five podcasts internationally. Oh my gosh, Leah, that's amazing. And you can see why everyone, why Leah is so popular with her beautiful message. And I'm so thrilled to be able to share it with all of you today. So Leah, thank you so much. You. I'm so excited for this fall. And thank you for sharing that everyone has that magnificence. Everybody has that shimmering inside your spirit and it's all within you. Sometimes we just need help bringing it out. So thank you for your gifts. They're so profound and I'm so grateful for your time today. Oh, thank you, Joni and everyone at Rebel 11. And thank you everyone who's here today. Um, I, again, this is without listeners, you know, 
so many of us are storytellers and artists at heart and we know that it's the people that we create for that evoke what we have to give and express and um yeah i'm very honored to be here thank you thank you